what's really interesting and you know, I was sort of on this trail years ago. I published a sort of integrative review on the role of the omega-3 mm-hmm. DHA transporter, MFSD2A, in the brain. And um, what's really interesting that is that animal studies, when you disrupt that transporter, it causes like 50%, you know, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier hmm. and like, like greater than 50% loss of omega-3 in the brain. So in my opinion it's sort of it's it's you know that's animal evidence of course there's human evidence where mfsd2a transporters decrease with age particularly rapidly in alzheimer's disease and with apoe4 Um, it leads to so there are genetic you know abnormalities and mutations that occur in that transporter where people have less of it and they have microcephaly so they have like smaller heads and they also have cognitive dysfunction, um, sort of cognitive impairment, things like that as well. Hmm. Um, How do we know that, Rhonda? So that's um, let's even put the pathology aside, the, the 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 sort of latter category. But let's just talk about um, well, again, what you've said explains something we've empirically felt is true, and the evidence suggests it. But this provides a mechanism, right? Which is ApoE4 carriers need a higher level of EPA and DHA to get the same benefit. That appears to be empirically correct. That would provide an explanation. Something else yeah. you said is it's almost like, a, you know, we talk about amino acid or protein uh, uh, resistance, basically, um, anabolic resistance as a person ages. They need more and more protein to get the same effect. It's almost like you're saying, if uh, you know, aging itself could create some resistance to dietary EPA and DHA that might require more as time goes on. Do you think there are also just genetic differences within the variant of normal, quote unquote, i.e. non-pathological, where one person would need more EPA and DHA to afford them the same benefit of protection as another person? I do. I know there's at least a couple that are known. Um, and, And so like some people have certain gene variants that actually they respond better to, for example, mm. omega-3 supplementation and others don't, um, where they would actually need a higher dose. And I think there's many more to be explored. Like we haven't unlocked all of that yet. When I say we, I mean the scientific community, not me, not me personally. Um, <laughs> but I, I do, you know, with the omega-3, and this again really hits home the preventative sort of role here that we can, you know, have in our Alzheimer's disease risk. I so with the MFSD2A, like this the the these transporters are actually lost. Um so there's a type of cell called pericytes, per E with an I, not to be confused with a parasite. They um they back they basically have these like big feet that wrap around the endothelial cells at the blood brain barrier. And they serve really two important, many important, but two main important functions. One is they are, they're basically constricting and dilating and like helping squeeze like the flow of blood. So they're like, they're regulating blood flow to the brain, but they also are uh, very important for that barrier. And they start to fall off with age, these pericytes and inflammation plays a big role in that. Um, But the MFSD2A transporters are concentrated on those cells too, right? And so you'll Mm. see like hotspots of where the pericytes, basically once those pericytes start to fall off, that is uh, when basically immune cells and everything starts going into the brain. It's like the start. It's like the start of the vicious inflammation cycle in the brain of the leakage, amyloid accumulation, just everything downstream, right? And so um, those... It, it, there's something there with those transporters of omega-3 that are right at the same site, you know, of where you lose those pericytes, which is also really interesting. And again, there's a lot of animal evidence that suggests the role of that transporter in blood-brain barrier integrity. Also, again, you can kind of like connect the dots here where you think, okay, well, this is a DHA, specifically a D, it's DHA in phospholipid form transporter. So it's like, okay, there's got to be something here with the omega-3. And, you know, there's, I know there's a, v- a variety of um, scientists that are investigating this, but I'm sort of excited that I, I am now going to be part of, of, of a team. So I, I've joined the Fatty Acid Research Institute, 
um, which is Bill Bill Har- Dr. Mm-hmm. Bill Harris's research institute, and as a research associate, associate and we are um, we've sort of secured a, a small grant to look at the role of omega three with blood brain barrier integrity and biomarkers in people, um, a variety of different uh, people that have small vessel disease um, that perhaps go on to get Alzheimer's disease, and so I think. There needs to be more research in this area because it really, it, it, it the implications here, I think, are really important um, with omega-3 intake. I mean, it's one of like, you know, so there's two main lifestyle interventions, I think, that that are important with, with respect to the blood-brain barrier. Three, actually, three. So not, basically not getting or fixing your type 2 diabetes. Mm-hmm. And then the omega-3 intake and like defining that will be sort of tricky, but, you know, Full stop, most people in the United States don't, they're not eating enough fatty fish and they're not supplementing with omega-3, which is sort of an alternative. And it was like, I think it was like a 2012 study out of Harvard that identified omega-3, low omega-3 intake from fish. So the marine type of omega-3, not not the plant AOA, as one of the top six preventable causes of death. So it was up there with basically like, (laughs) it was smoking. Yeah. And blood pressure and, you know, obesity and being sedentary. Low omega-3 was like, I, it blew my mind. And the the they calculated some, you know, I'm not a biostatistician, but there was some calculation done with estimating the number of deaths caused by not getting in enough omega-3 each year. It was like the same as, the same number of deaths. It was like 84,000 deaths a year from low omega-3 intake from fish. I wonder though if that's also just a marker for poor health. Uh, and it, that's the challenge of all of those studies, right? Is totally. in some cases with smoking, it's pretty obvious that there's causality there. I think there also is with blood pressure. Um, I, I, but you know, you could argue that never in the history of the world has there been a person who has, you know, I'm making, I'm being a bit facetious, who has, you know, a high omega three index who eats junk food and fast food all day, right? Like those, those can't coexist. I want to ask one clarifying question, Rhonda. Certainly I know that when you're talking about omega-3s, you're referring to the marine variant of which we have EPA and DHA, but the transporter, if I understood correctly, is it a transporter only for DHA and its phospholipid form? And if so, where, what is the importance of EPA in this? Great question. Um, so the MFSD2A transporter that I've been referring to is specific to DHA. And DHA, the form of DHA is lysophosphatidylcholine DHA. And that, you know, so that that specific, we, we make it. And so we basically get, D, when we take in DHA from fish or from a supplement, Uh, Our bodies, the higher amount of DHA that we take in, we add that lysophosphatidylcholine group to the DHA. We also have DHA in free fatty acid form bound to albumin. And albumin is not supposed to, that doesn't get into the brain, but it takes it to the brain, blood brain barrier, and the free fatty acid can sort of diffuse passively uh, across the blood brain barrier as well. Um, Same with EPA. Um, with respect to your question, oh, I um, see. But where- because the phospholipids on the DHA, it needs a dedicated transporter, whereas yes. the unphosphorylated, well, not phosphorylated, the one that doesn't have a phosphatidyl, uh, a, um, yeah. A, yeah, a phos side chain, phosphatidyl, li- a yeah, phosphatidyl lipid side chain can diffuse without a transporter. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So there's right. that. It, so it's free fatty acid um, bound to albumin, and it can just diffuse across the, okay. the brain. Yeah. So that's how EPA is generally getting in the brain. And then, but- then second question for you on that thread. Uh, and feel free to go into as much depth as possible because I know this is actually a very important topic that is somewhat controversial. What do you see as the relative importance of DHA and EPA? The the conventional thinking, I think, is that EPA probably more important in the heart, DHA probably more important in the brain. I'm sure that's a gross oversimplification, but uh, can you expand on that? Yeah, I can try. I don't know that it's really known. Mm. So, um, so you know, my the way I personally think about both EPA and DHA. So there, there's a variety of metabolites and of DHA 
um, that are involved in resolving inflammation. So these are resolvins, the maricins, the SPMs, protectins. And EPA also has uh, some of those metabolites as well. And it also plays a direct role in inflammation through the sort of, um, I don't want to say inhibition, but like dampening the prostaglandins mm-hmm. and leukotrienes and a lot of the other inflammatory processes. So it's kind of like a, a, a an approach where you're you're affecting inflammation from multiple ways, right? It's like a multi-pronged pr- approach. And I mentioned fibrinogen earlier about like fibrinogen, you know, it's an inflammatory protein. Well, it's involved in coagulation, but it's a mark, it's something that we do measure as a, a marker of inflammation. So um, there's studies showing that people that are exposed to particulate air matter, their fibrinogen, go, fibrinogen goes up. But if they have a higher dose of omega-3 uh, or higher intake of omega-3, it blunts that effect. Again, through the inflammation, right? So, you know, both DHA and EPA are important in my mind for the brain as well. I mean, there's a variety of studies that have looked at even uh, depression. And like you can you can induce depressive symptoms in a person by injecting them with what's called lipopolysaccharide, which is a component of the outer cell membrane of gram-negative bacteria. We have billions of those in our gut. In fact, there's about one gram of lipopolysaccharide or LPS for short. It's also referred to as endotoxin. There's about one gram of that in our gut. Well, you can inject people with a low dose of that, something that actually would be somewhat, you know, I would say equivalent to someone with intestinal permeability. And it can cause depressive symptoms in people compared to those given a placebo. And you can blunt that depressive symptom effect with EPA probably because of the Mm. inflammatory, the blunting of the inflammatory response. And there have been some, you know, this is like, this is a field that's, again, understudied, underfunded, but, you know, some preliminary evidence, randomized controlled trials, small randomized controlled trials that need to be, of course, repeated with larger sample sizes, you know, they're, they're basically showing that supplementation with EPA can help with depression. Yeah, this so, is such a frustrating thing for me. And I, I, obviously, I know it is for you and for many others, including Bill Harris. Um, if you took the cost of one phase three anti-amyloid failed drug trial, just take one of them, right? Like there's been dozens of them. Just take the dollars that were spent on one of those guaranteed to fail phase three trials and put that money into a preventive trial that looks at something that's got real feasibility or you know something that's really interesting like the optimal supplementation of DHA in the right pa- patient population group we could have an answer and yet you know for obvious reasons there's an incentive to do a phase 3 drug trial on a candidate with an IND uh, there's not an incentive from a financial perspective to study these other things. Um, and I think for a disease like Alzheimer's disease, that's particularly problematic because I, as I suspect we'll discuss, you know, unlike cardiovascular disease where yes, prevention is still the best strategy. You can come in late to the game and still make a difference. I don't think the evidence is particularly compelling that that is true for Alzheimer's disease. Now, I'd love to be wrong, but I have yet to see compelling evidence that you can be a Johnny come lately to that pathology and have an impact. It's hard to fix those leaks in the brain once they're started, right? I mean, and that and that also is why I think there have been failed trials also with, there have been a few with omega-3 supplementation in people that already have Alzheimer's disease. And you're giving them like, I don't know, at most two grams. Right. I've seen studies like 500 milligrams. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like you, you, you know, patients with high triglycerides or cardiovascular problems and are- we're giving them four grams. Four. Yeah. I know, at least four. You know, this is, this, is, this is something that has the safety of a nutrient, but literally acts, can act like a pharmacological drug, you know, at, you know, at higher doses. And so um, I, I agree with you. I think- it is much more challenging to fix, you know, when you when you have Alzheimer's disease. And certainly, like I'm talking about, like the leaks in the brain, but like 
But then what happens after that, the amyloid accumulation? And like, when you start to get to this level, when you're, you've got all of that, I mean, good luck. It's going to be, it is going to be challenging and you're going to have to take, it, it's not going to just be fixing the amyloid. You're going to have to have a cocktail that are going multiple angles, I think, in, in order to get some improvement. Uh, I think the amyloid and perhaps also fixing this, the blood brain barrier leaks as well, maybe at the same time with the cocktail may help a little bit, but prevention is the way to go. I mean, like it's so much better to not get Alzheimer's disease than to try to fix it once you have it because it's it is a very complicated disease with lots of things going on. Uh, 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 uh.